necessarily will have to be about myself. And I'm going all out. Now that nutty picture of me on the cover of All the Road just results from the fact that I just got down from a high mountain where I've been for two months completely alone. <laughs> usually I was in the habit of combing my hair, of course. Because you got to get rides on the highway and all that. And usually you want the girls to look at you as though you were a man. You're not a wild beast. But now my poet friend, Gregory Corso, opened his shirt took out a silver crucifix that was hanging from a chain <coughs> and said, wear this. And wear it outside your shirt. Don't comb your hair. <laughs> so I spent several days around San Francisco, going around with him and others like that. The parties, arties, parts, jam sessions, bars, poetry reads, churches. Walking, talking poetry in the streets. Walking, talking God in the streets. And at one point, a strange gang of hoodlums got mad and said, what right has he got to wear that? My own gang of musicians and poets told him to cool it. Finally, on the third day, Mademoiselle Magazine wanted to take pictures of us all. So I posed just like that, wild hair, crucifix and all, with Gregory Corso, Alan Ginsberg, and Philip Whalen. The only publication which later did not erase the crucifix from my breast, from that plaid sleeveless cotton shirt front, New York Times. Yeah. Therefore, the New York Times is as beaten as I am. And I'm glad I've got a friend. <laughs> oh, I mean it sincerely. God bless the New York Times for not erasing the crucifix from my picture as though it was something that's painful. As a matter of fact, who's really beat around here? I mean, if you want to talk of beat, it's beat down. Well, the people who erase the crucifix and the beat down ones are not the New York Times myself and Gregory Corso the poet. ashamed to wear the crucifix of my Lord is because I am beat. That is, I believe in beatitude and that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Now I'm sure no priest would have condemned me for wearing the crucifix outside my shirt everywhere and no matter where I went, even to have my picture made by a man in little way. So you people don't believe in God, huh? You're all 
went to mixed my go with all Marxists and Freudians. <laughs> Why don't you come back in a million years and tell me all about it, Angel? Yeah. You know, recently, Ben Hecht said to me on TV, he said, why are you afraid to speak out your mind? What's wrong with this country? What's everybody afraid of? Was he talking about me? And all he wanted me to do was to speak my mind out against me. And he sneeringly brought up people like John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower, the Pope, all kinds of people like that. People that he would eventually sneer at along with Drew Pearson, the radio commentator. Against the world, he wanted. This is his idea of freedom. He calls it freedom. Well, who knows? My God. But that the universe is not one vast sea of compassion, actually. Veritable holy honey. Beneath all this show of personality and cruelty. But you see, I want to speak for things. For things. For the crucifix I speak out. For the star of Israel I speak out. For the divinest man who ever lived who was a German. Fuck, I speak out. For sweet Muhammad I speak out. For Buddha I speak out. It's separate. Why should I attack what I love out of life? Now this is beat. And you say, live your lives out. Love your lives out. Love your lives out. And when they come and stone you, at least you won't have a glass house. Just your glassy flesh. Well, then why I'll leave a picture of me on the cover on the road where I look so beat? back much further than 1948, when John Cleland Holmes and I were sitting around trying to dig up the meaning of the lost generation, the subsequent existentialism, and I said, you know, this is really a beat generation. And he left up and he said, that's it, that's right. But see, go back much further than that, all the way back to the 1880s, when my grandfather, Jean-Baptiste Kerouac, used to go out on the porch in big thunderstorms and wave his kerosene lamp at the lightning and yell, well, go ahead. You're more powerful than I am. Well, then strike me and put the light out. All well, the mother and children cowered in the kitchen. But the light never went out. There is no doubt about the beat generation, at least the core of it, of being a new group of American people intent on joy. Yeah. Irresponsibility. A dying man on an empty room. No one of these generations goes back to the wild parties my father used to have at home in the 1920s and 30s in New England that were so fantastically loud nobody could sleep for blocks around. And when the cops came, well, they always had a drink too. <laughs> Go back to the wild and raving childhood of playing the shadow when the wind swept trees of New England's lethal auto. Imitate Lamont Cranston, so cool and sure, suddenly going, <laughs> <laughs> laughing away in the alleys of New York imagination. It's back to the maniacal laughter of certain neighborhood mad boys, the furious humor of whole gangs playing basketball till long after dark in the park. To Joan Crawford, <laughs> Joan Crawford, her raw shanks in the fog, in striped blouse, smoking a cigarette at sticky lips in the door of the waterfront dive. <laughs> to the glee of America, to the honesty of America, to Clark Gable with his certain smile and that confident leer. Well, like my grandfather, this America was invested with wild, self-believing individuality. And this had begun to disappear around the end of World War II with so many great guys dead. Well, I could think of half a dozen or so from my own boyhood groups. And when suddenly it began to emerge again, the hipsters began to appear, gliding around and saying, Crazy man. <laughs> Crazy. Crazy man. Yeah, when I first saw the hipsters creeping around Times Square in 1944, well, I didn't like them either. <coughs> One of them, Hunky of Chicago, came up to me and he said, Man, I'm beat. And I knew right away what he meant somehow. But at that time, I still didn't like Bob, which was then being introduced by Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Bax Jackson on Vibes. Because you see, earlier, I thought all my jazz the old Mint Playhouse. When I first heard Burton Dibb at the Three Deuces, man, 
I knew. They were serious musicians playing a goofy new sound. And they didn't care what I thought, what my friends thought. In fact, I was leaning up against the bar with a beer. Dizzy comes over to get a glass of water from the bartender, pushes himself right up against me, reaches both arms around both sides of my head to get the glass, then dances away. <laughs> As though knowing I'd be saying about him someday. <laughs> but I want his arrangements to be named after me someday by some goofy circumstance. Charlie Parker was spoken of in Harlem as being the greatest musician since Chew Berry and Louis Armstrong. Yeah. Even the hipsters whose music was pop, well, they looked like criminals. They kept talking about the same things that I like. Long outlines for a, full of personal experience and vision. Not long confessions full of hope that have become illicit and repressed by war. Stirring rumblings of a new soul. So Hunk appeared to us and said, I'm beat. Radiant light shining out of his despairing eyes. I'm beat. A word perhaps brought from some Midwest carnival a junk cafeteria. Well, it was a new language. But you soon learned it like hung up. Couldn't be a more economical term to mean so many things. Some of these hipsters were raving mad, talking tenderly. It was jazzy. Symphony says all night, not in dance, and pop show was all. 1948, it all began to take shape. That was a wild, vibrant year when a group of us walked down the street and yelled, hello, and he would stop talking and he might give us a friendly look. The hipsters had eyes. That was the year I saw Montgomery clipped, unshaven, wearing a sloppy jacket, slouching down Madison Avenue with a companion. It was the year I saw Charlie Parker strolling out 8th Avenue in a black turtleneck sweater with Babs Gonzalez and a beautiful girl. By 1948, the hipsters were divided into cool and hot. Much of the misunderstanding about the beat generation in general today derives from the fact there are two distinct styles of hipsterism. The cool today is your bearded, laconic sage or schlurm, before a hardly touched beard of beat dick dies, whose speech is low and unfriendly. Girls say nothing in the way of black. The hot today is a crazy, talkative, shining eyed, often innocent, open hearted nut who races from bar to bar, pad to pad, looking for everybody, shouting, restless, squishy, trying to make it with the subterranean beat takes to ignore him. Well, uh, most beat generation artists belong to the hot school, naturally, since that hard, gym like flame needs a little heat. And in many cases, the mixture is 50 50. Hot hips are like myself and finally cool it in Buddhist meditation. But when I go in a jazz joint, man, I still feel like yelling, blow, baby, blow! Yeah. In 1948, the hot hipsters are racing around in cars like an on the road looking for wild ball and jazz. Like Willis Jackson, Lucky Thompson, Tubby Jackson's big baby. Well, the cool hipsters cooled it. Dead silence. More formal and excellent musical groups like Lenny Tristano and Lionel Davis. Ah, ah. It's still just about the same, really. Except now, except now, it's begun to grow into a national generation. And the main beat has stuck. The wall hipsters hate the word. Well, beat originally meant poor, down and out, dead beat, sad, but on the bum, sleeping in subways. But now that the term is beginning to belong officially, it's being made to stretch to include those people who do not sleep in subways, but have a certain new gesture or attitude, which I can only describe as a new moray. Beat generation has simply become a slogan or label for a revolution in manners in America. And Marlon Brando, he certainly wasn't the first to betray it on the screen. Dane Clark with his pinched Dostoevsky and face and Brooklyn accent. And of course, Garfield's were first. The private eyes were beat, if you'll recall. Oh, God. Lori was beat. When well, him, Peter Lori started a whole revival. I mean, the slouchy street ball. I rode on the road in three weeks, in the beautiful month of May, 1951, while living in a Chelsea district of Lower West Side, Manhattan on a hundred foot roll of paper. You put the beat generation in words there. Saying at the point where I'm taking part in a wild kind of collegiate party with a bunch of kids in an abandoned miner's shack. 
Well, these kids are great. Where are Dean Moriarty and Carlo Marx? I guess they just <coughs> wouldn't belong in this gang. They're too dark, too strange, too subterranean. I am slowly beginning to join a new kind of beat generation. <coughs> the manuscript of On the Rose was turned down on the grounds that it was a displeased the sales manager of my publisher. But now my editor, a very intelligent man, said. <laughs> Jack, this is just like Dostoevsky. <laughs> but what can I do at this time? It was too early. And for the next six years, I was a bum, a brakeman, a seaman, a panhandler, a pseudo-Indian in Mexico, anything and everything, and went on writing because my hero was Goethe, and I believed in art, and hoped to someday write the third part of Faust, which I have done in Dr. Sachs. Then in 1952, an article appeared in the New York Times Sunday Magazine with the headline, This is a Beat Generation. In the article it said that I'd come up with the term first, when the face was harder to recognize. The face of the generation. <coughs> and after that, there was some talk of the Beat Generation. But then in 1955, I published an excerpt from On the Road under the pseudonym Jean-Louis, and it was copyrighted as being an excerpt from a novel in progress entitled Beat Generation, which I later changed to On the Road at the insistence of my new editor. And so then the term began to move a little faster. The term and the cats. Everywhere began to appear strange hip cats. And even college kids were around being heaven cool and used the terms I'd heard on Times Square in the early 40s. Growing somehow. When the publisher finally took a dare and published on the road in 1957, it burst open, it mushroomed, and everybody began talking about a beat generation. I was being interviewed everywhere I went about what I meant by such a thing. People began calling themselves beatniks, beats, spotniks, jazzniks, pugniks. Finally, I was called the avatar of all this. Yet it was as a Catholic. It was not at the insistence of any of these Nicks, and certainly not with their approval either. And I went one afternoon to a church of my childhood, St. Joan d'Arc in Lowell, Massachusetts. And suddenly, with tears in my eyes, I had a vision of what I must have meant with beat when I heard the holy silence in the church. was the only one in there. It was 5 p.m. Dogs were barking outside. Children yelling. The fall leaves. And the candles were flickering alone. Just for me. The vision of the word beat as meaning beatific. And there's a priest preaching on Sunday morning, but all of a sudden through a side door in the church comes a group of beat generation characters dressed in strapped raincoats like the IRA, <laughs> coming in to silently dig the religion. Well, I knew it then. But hey, this was 1954. So they went horror, I felt, in 1957 and later 1958 to suddenly see Beat being taken up by everybody. Press and TV and the Hollywood Bosch circuit to include the juvenile delinquency shot. And the horrors of a mad, teeming billy club, New York and L.A. And they began to call that Beat, that beatific. A bunch of fools marching against the San Francisco Giants protesting baseball. Is it in my name? <laughs> <laughs> and here I am with my childhood ambition to be a big league baseball star like Ted Williams. <laughs> so when Bobby Thompson hit that home run in 1951, 
Man, I trembled with joy. I couldn't get over it for days and wrote poems about how it's possible for the human spirit to win after all. But when a murder, a routine murder took place in North Beach, well, they labeled it a beat generation slave. Although in my childhood, I'd always been famous as an eccentric on the block. Stopping the younger kids from throwing rocks at squirrels. Stopping them from frying snakes and cans. Blowing up frogs with straws. Because my brother died at the age of nine. And his name was Gerard Kerouac. And he told me, Dijon, little John, never hurt another living being all living beings, whether it's just a little cat or a squirrel or whatever, all are going straight to heaven into God's snowy arms. And so never hurt anything. If you see anybody hurt anything, will you stop them as best you can? When he died, a pile of gloomy nuns in black from St. Louis to France Parish filed to his deathbed to hear his last words about heaven. My father, too, Leo, well, he never lifted a hand to punish me, but to punish the little pets in our house. And this teaching was delivered to me by the men in my house. And I have never had anything to do with violence, hatred, cruelty, and all that horrible nonsense which never left, because God is gracious beyond all human imagining, he will forgive in the long end. That million years, I'm asking about you, America. Now, they have beatnik routines on TV. Starting out with satires about girls in black, fellas in jeans with snap knives and sweaters and swastikas tattooed under their armpits. And it'll come, it'll, it'll come to respectable MCs and spectaculars coming out naturally attired in Brooks Brothers jean-type tailoring and sweater-type pull So you see, it's just a simple change in fashion and manner. Just the history for us. Like from the age of reason, from old Voltaire to chair, to romantic chatter to the moonlight. From Teddy Roosevelt to God's mystery. You see, there's nothing to get excited about. The beach comes out actually of old American whoopee. And it'll only change a few dresses and pants. And make chairs useless in the living room. Pretty soon we'll have beat secretaries of state, and then I'll be instituted new tinsel. In fact, new reasons for malice, new reasons for virtue, and new reasons for forgiveness. But woe, woe unto those who think that the beat generation means crime, delinquency, immorality, amorality. Woe unto those who attack it on the grounds they just simply don't understand history and the earnings of human souls. Woe well, to those who don't realize that America must, will, is changing now, and for the better, I say. Woe well, to those who believe in the atomic bomb, who believe in hating mothers and fathers and deny the most important of the Ten Commandments. And woe well, to those who don't believe in the unbelievable sweetness of sex love. Woe well, to those who are the standard bearers of death, who believe in horror and conflict and violence, and fill our books and screens and living room with all that crap. Well, in fact, unto those who make evil movies about the beat generation where innocent housewives are raped by beatniks. And woe unto those who are the real dreary sinners, who even God finds room to forgive. to those who spit on the beat generation. The wind will blow it back. So much for the intellectual revolution. To the extent that the beat generation should be thought of as a literary movement, 
It has been systematically vitiated by this insistence on the holiness of the impromptu and the urge to play the lunatic. Now, whether Jack Kerouac has traces of a talent, he remains, basically, a high school athlete who went from low Massachusetts to Skid Row, uh, losing his eraser en route. His method of composition, as he himself describes it, is to put a roll of paper in the typewriter and bang out eight or ten feet a day. Nothing must be changed, because whatever you try to delete, that's what's most important to a doctor. Look, I'm an artful storyteller, a writer in the great French narrative tradition. I'm not the spokesman for a million hoods. Now, Thomas Wolfe. Thomas Wolfe woke me up to America as a poem instead of America as a place to struggle around and sweat in. And Hemingway was fascinating. Those, those pearls of words on a white page giving you an exact picture. But now Wolfe was a torrent of American heaven and hell and opened my eyes unto America as a subject in itself. You see, by not revising what you've already written, you simply give the reader the actual workings of your mind during the writing itself. Confess your thoughts about events in your own unchangeable way. Well, look, did you ever hear a guy telling a long, wild tale, tale to a bunch of guys in a bar, and they're all listening and smiling? Did you ever hear that guy go back to a previous sentence to improvement of the phrase rhythmic thought impact? <laughs> <laughs> and as he pauses to blow his nose, isn't he, isn't he planning his next sentence? And when he lets that sentence loose, isn't it once and for all the way he wanted to say it? Doesn't he depart from the thought of that sentence? And as Shakespeare says, forever holds his tongue on the subject that he's passed over it the way a part of a river flows over a rock once and for all and can never return or flow any other way in time. And be sure of this. I spent my entire youth writing slowly with revisions and endless rehashing speculation and deleting. And I got so I was writing one sentence a day. And that sentence had no feeling. God damn it, feeling is what I like in art, not craftiness and the hiding of feelings. Um, I wonder, Mr. Kerouac, do you try to see everything clearly and not think of any words, just to see everything as clearly as possible and then write out the feeling? You sound like a writing seminar at Indiana University. <laughs> <laughs> well, I take Kerouac's particular phrasing at that point. It's symptomatic of a narcissistic sickness in all deep writing. This is important, it says, because it happened to sacred me. The object is to read a document of one's own psyche on the assumption that every reader will find it just as fascinating as your psychiatrist does. Well, I'm sorry, boys. I find it zany, without illumination. Precious rather than personal. Just plain dull. Listen to Jack Kerouac's prose. In the autumn of 1951, I began thinking of Cody Palmer. <coughs> I was in New York and I wanted to go to California and see him. But I had no money for him. And I'm in an old L station on 3rd Avenue and 47th, sitting at wooden sunken seat benches along the wall, and the porter sign in the corner is almost all faded. And in the raw wood wall, a strange, beautiful window with blue and red stained glass fringes. The floor old worn planks. And the whole place shakes as a train approaches. A huge old iron pot belly stove. It's showing through grayish, it's iron to see. And the stovepipe goes up four feet, then over seven feet, climbing slightly, then up two feet to disappear into a fantastic ceiling of carved wood in some kind of chimney flue. And at the wall tops along the ceiling are carved raw buttresses like in Victorian porches. And the place is so brown that any light looks brown in it. It's fit for the sorrows of winter. It reminds me, speechlessly, of old blizzards when my father was ten, of old workmen spinning in Cody's farm. Outside, sprawling outline of life's crazy crooked wood house with fringes, weather vane tower that made itself pale, shapeless, smock green. Stained with ages of rain and snow, one time red, now with a forlorn hint of red. The timbers on tracks are splintered and aged beyond recognition. Visions of coat. The only people for me are the math ones. The ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be sane. Desires for everything at the same time. The ones who never yawn as their commonplace thing, but always burn, burn, burn. Like fabulous Roman candles exploding like spiders across the stars. In this center, you see the blue tender light pop, and everybody goes, oh. <laughs> In its flirtation with depravity, 
on the road belongs to a new bohemianism in American fiction, in which an experimental style is combined with eccentric character and a morally neutral point of view. It's not so much a novel as it is a long, affectionate lark inspired by the Beat Generation and an example of the degree to which some of the most original work being done in this country today has come to depend upon the bizarre and the offbeat for its creative stimulus. Jack Kerouac has written an enormously readable and entertaining book, but one must read it in the same mood that he might visit a, a sideshow. The freaks are fascinating, although they are hardly a part of our lives. <laughs> well, the, the non-sequiturs of the B generation have become this author's own plotless, seamless technique. It's as if by absolving his characters of all responsibility, he absolves himself of the author's customary attention to motivation and credibility. On the road. It, it is a road, as far as the characters are concerned, that lead nowhere, in which the novelist himself may not travel more than once. Well, what's your road, man? Holy Boy Road, Mad Mad Road, Rainbow Road, Guppy Road? It's an anywhere road for anybody, anyhow. I am one of the reconstructed radicals of my generation. Much of which has happened over the past 20 years or so has challenged my basic beliefs, but I still adhere to them. Life is complicated enough without having to make it into a poem. I am convinced that ethical values will reemerge. What gives meaning to life is the survival of these values. It's a sad thing for America that this beat generation is supposed to represent rebellion and unorthodoxy. Why, after listening to Kerouac, I understand less about what they stand for than I did before. I see no virtue in organized confusion. Beat generation is a symbol, sort of a joke. The issue is not whether there is a beat generation, but whether civilization will survive. There's no valor in their beat. The kind of fight and irresponsibility. Irresponsibility? <laughs> Inarticulateness in Jack Kerouac is proof positive of saintlyhood and virtue. He can be heard in the orgiastic mumblings of every Elvis Presley record ever made. Oh. <laughs> For an intellectual rebellion, they think to try the library. It's still the most subversive building in town, and it's still in the headquarters. Even rebels should find it useful to know something, if only to learn to sit still with a book in hand. When you take dehydrated hipster and add watery words to get instant beatnik, the flavor is gone. But the lack of taste lingers on <laughs> With regard to Kerouac's attire, this um, glow-in-the-dark gold thread <coughs> being worn by the Buddha in his vanguard reading, seems to be the principal symbol of his protest still remaining. One recalls a line from Kenneth Rexroth's poem dealing with the death of Dylan Thomas. You killed him in your goddamn Brooks Brothers suit. Well, we can only shudder at the genocide that should be wreaked by Kerouac's haberdashery. <laughs> <laughs> I could never 
understand the fascination these people have with Kerouac, except that he thought that they were American, and they are. He used to think that Neil was Huck Finn, and Bob Burford was smart Alec Tom Sawyer. But Neil is not Huck Finn. Huck Finn pulses are always good and constructive. And Neil was just a terribly, terribly treacherous, <laughs> untrustworthy, destructive person. There was just a natural hatred between me and somebody like Neil Cassidy because I just thought he was a sponger and useless. I didn't think he was charming. He never said anything. He never did anything. He just sat around and became, well, an encumbrance. Well, I just never wanted to have anything to do with him. Now, I thought he was good looking. I thought he was a criminal in the worst sense. That is, I just thought that he could perform a criminal ripoff on anybody. I don't think he had any loyalty to anybody. And Kerouac used him for literary material, but I just wasn't interested in that. What I liked was the way Jack talked about the way those people walked in those small towns in Massachusetts. You know, slouching with their hands in their pockets. <laughs> Kerouac used to walk like that. And he had this great sympathy for this culture from which he was from. And I always thought it was a shame that he didn't do more with it. Jack was living with his mother up in Ozone Park. He'd spend most of his time up there. And then every now and then he'd come roaring into New York to party, to get laid drunk. Everything. <laughs> and during that particular period, he'd usually stay at my place. Because he had to stay both place. And he'd be around for two or three days, maybe three, four, and then he'd just disappear again. I went up to Ozone Park once. Oh, Lord. It's a very formalized situation. Me there is the other side of Jack brought to the uttermost. Very precise and fastidious and just hated disorder. <coughs> and yet, she was very irrational. Once I was up high for a place to sleep and Jack invited me out to Ozone Park where he was living with his mother. <laughs> On the way, we, we enjoyed ourselves immensely, laughing and talking about things. When we got there, and she took one look at me. Jack's attitude changed almost immediately. I mean, she dominated his life to a terrific extent. She didn't approve of Ginsburg. She didn't approve of anyone that I know of. You know, as a matter of fact, I couldn't even tell you what she looked like. She was so evasive and so, so absorbed in Jack that it was almost impossible to get any kind of a picture of her at all. She might as well not have been there, except for the effect she had on Jack. So, I made that long trip back to New York. <laughs> He stayed down there at the house. <laughs> Jack took me home to meet the family. I guess it was the first time I met his mother and father. So he comes trooping up with his little friend Lucian, and God knows what he told his parents about his little friend Lucian, right? Well, so we sit around, kind of uncomfortable, and his father says, let's go out and get a beer. Yeah, so we go trooping across the park to the nearest bar. I come up with a quarter for my beer. Old man Kerouac says, no. I can buy a millionaire's stock of beer. <laughs> How did he figure I was a millionaire? Jack told him. Up until the last time we saw each other, it was our greatest joke. But my dad was a sheep worker in Wyoming. When the weather got rough, he worked at the Vanguard in Denver. Writing. Jack. I mean, he 
wasn't just interested in writing. No matter what else he was doing, he always found time to write. It was like you gotta, you gotta eat or breathe or shit. He was always writing. And no matter how much he had to do with a job, or driving around in a car, or traveling, or this and that, he always found time to scratch his little books. He didn't have to do it right away either, which was a great virtue that he had. He had a memory like few men that you meet. Like he used to say, that's why they call me Memory Babe. That's what they call him in Lowell. He had a fantastic Was, uh, well, he was, well, you know, he was, he couldn't be led. And he was recalcitrant. He was a pig, and he was this, and that, and the other. But he was everything in a man that Edie thought could ever exist. Now, Edie Parker was the best woman Jack ever got involved with, bar none. Now, Jack didn't have trouble with women. But women had trouble with Jack. And he didn't have bad luck with eating. It's just that he didn't want to be cornered into a situation where he was building something that he just wasn't building. I mean, he didn't want to do that. It never crossed his mind. Somebody would say, well, let's get married and move to the suburbs. And he'd like disappear. <laughs> Now, money and wealth, now that did impress Jack. And I imagine the six months of dibbling and dazzling around there, well, that, well, that amused him. But anything that tended to trap Kerouac, whether it was a woman, or a job, or a jail sentence, well, he just didn't want any part of that. My mother to this day will break into tears whenever she thinks of Jack, simply because he was so nice to her. And he wasn't putting her on. That's just what you do with mother. <laughs> Everybody was attracted to Jack. You could not be in those days. My first wife, Mary, she loved Jack. She realized that he was a potential threat to the tranquility of our household. Well, he'd blow in and everything would be in an uproar for who knows how long. And he was never like Neil. No, he didn't try to control, he didn't con. It was just, it was like, ooh, la la. It was like, She went along with it, even though she realized his effect on me was a danger to her. But that was mainly her war with me, not him. When I first met Jack, I never read a word he wrote. He hadn't finished high school at the town of the city then. Of course, I read it all and it completely knocked me out. But suddenly, I saw that this man, who I like terribly well anyway, did something else. He was a Tremendously gifted, unique human being. All through the getting of the town the city published, in the next couple of years while it was being typed and passed around from person to person, he was thinking about the next book and talking about the next book, which he always called On the Road. He wrote seven, maybe you know, ten beginnings to that book. They all didn't seem right to him. This went on for 18 months at least. This was in 1949. And he became more and more hung up on his inability to write the damn thing. I mean, he couldn't find that entry into it. And he wrote that whole thing which is in the visions of Cody Neal's youth. He wrote that on top. <laughs> 
For a month he sat out there in Ozone Park. Every night he'd get high on pot and he'd write that stuff. And he would then bring it into me or perhaps to Alan, too. <laughs> he'd wait till his mother went to bed. And he had this, this tiny little room with a desk in it, sort of an L shape, like a dormer. <laughs> and he closed the door. And as always, Jack's desk was incredibly neat. I mean, everything was completely put together. <laughs> he'd blast and get high, and then he'd write all night. And the reason why those sentences are so long and exfoliating and so incredible is because of the pot, it seems to me. God, he loved that stuff, but he still didn't get <coughs> much of the way in. <laughs> That's when he decided, oh, in 51, by then he got married again and moved into Chelsea. He literally said, fuck it, I'm going to sit down and tell the truth. <laughs> and that's what he did. Well, Jack in those years was just literally up to mine. Because when I first met him, all he wanted to do was get a farm out in New Hampshire. He didn't want to live in the city. He didn't want to go on the road. He just wanted to find some girl somewhere, get married, and move out to New Hampshire, raise a family. <coughs> Thanksgiving, Christmas, and things like that. And yet, of course, he was always drawn in that other direction. It's more powerful, it turned out. In those years, those two things were just completely clashing with him. Now, his father's admonition to be a good boy and take care of your mother was very strong in him then. That pull toward chaos, toward the road, toward the west, was equally strong. He'd be stronger, it turned out. Jack had been at work on the town and the city for nine months when Neil Cassidy burst onto the New York scene, December 1946. Neil had come to live with us. And he'd been in jail for stealing an automobile or something, joyride. And he had a crew cut haircut. Well, back in my grandmother's generation, short hair was bad. Whereas in this generation, long hair is bad. Well, Neil moved in. And I can hear my grandmother saying, we can't let this boy come around here with short hair. Well, what will the neighbors think? And I'd say, Grandma, we'll just have to let the neighbors worry about their own problems. So Neil moved in, and they didn't get along well. It was never difficult or anything, but there was always this conflict going on between them. She thinking that perhaps he would lead me astray or something. And Neil did write. Well, I read two or three chapters of a book he'd started. And it was really humorous. His death, I don't know, perhaps it was on purpose. Actually, Neil and I either lived in the same room or within a block of each other for two or three years. And we were very, very close. to another world then, Algiers was. I think that Burroughs was very much horrified by his neighbors, but I am sure they by he. <laughs> <laughs> Joe never slept at night. Since the kids would be sleeping and Bill would be sleeping, she would be up most of the night looking for something to do. The house was L-shaped and porched all around. And outside there was this dead, ghastly, barren tree, and it was just covered with lizards. She would go out in the middle of the night and rake the lizards off of the trees. <laughs> I don't think she killed them. They'd go back, back at their home. She just had to have something to do at four o'clock in the morning in the moonlight. <laughs> I'd never been to a movie till I was 21. I had no reason to be suspicious. I was so naive. I guess Jones raking lizards off of trees is pretty odd behavior. 
bathing 13 black cats and tying them up with bits of string was rather odd, too. <laughs> but then I met Neil Cassidy. That was really odd. After we left Algiers from California, we were going through the bayous. It was midnight on this spooky little road with all the willow trees hanging down. And Jack proceeded to tell the story of the death of Danny the camera, just like we were listening to a version of the shadow. It was really wild. He had me jumping shivers up and down. And he was talking in that kind of voice. on the radio, because at that time all our spook stories were on Light the Shadow and some other old time radio shows, and that's just how Jack plays it, speaking in a low, mysterious voice and picturing the whole thing with the river, the dark, and the streets. I felt like I was there, and I got the shivers. Then, we all took our clothes off as we were going across Texas. unreal. I mean, we did take our clothes off because it was sweltering hot. I mean, we were just dying. We didn't have any cold cream. <laughs> I would love to have had some. Any kind of cream. But the most memorable part of that trip, Jack didn't go into much description of. We stopped at some ruins and we all went over there and for miles around we couldn't see a thing. See a car coming for a hundred miles down the road, and we were all cavorting naked through the ruins, and we saw a car approaching, which we all proceeded to ignore until it was just a few hundred feet away. Jack and I sprinted across the highway to get back in the car. Neil struck this magnificent pose on one of these concrete platforms. <laughs> you could see a car coming. This elderly couple going down. You could see this old woman on the passenger side pointing, and Jack and I were describing exactly what she was saying. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> because Neil did have a beautiful body. Isn't that a magnificent statue, and the way it's held up through all the years with all this deterioration around it? <laughs> there wasn't a finger out of place. He must have stood there in that hot sun for a long while because they just slowed down to a crawl. Jack and I were getting lower and lower in the back seat, of course. You know, now when I look back on it, we really were lucky that none of us was ever arrested. But the ending of that trip was so abrupt. Neil left Jack and I on the street in San Francisco. Neil just drove away, leaving Jack and I there without a penny one, with nothing but a lousy suitcase and each other. Why, Jack and I just stood there looking at each other as we thought, where do we go from here? It was a wonderful trip, of course, but with no one thinking about tomorrow. Toby Pomeray knew in the West, and I rode with him later, were always tremendously frightening two-lane bumpy roads, with those ditches on both sides, that side fence, that range fence next, maybe a sad cut of earth, then a hairhead of grass on a lump of sand, then an endless range leading to mountains that belong to other states sometimes. And that road always seems destined to bounce you in the ditch, because it humps over each way, and the feeling of the car rolling on a side angle and climbing to a ditch, and a bump on the road will bounce it right. As a consequence of this, western roads are lonelier to ride than any other. Long haul, straight ahead. And on a Saturday night, you can see maybe five, five cars in the next five miles coming your way, each headlight smaller, and creating the illusion of water on the road. When they're so far away, the light's absorbed probably by the night mist, or whatever it really is. The mirage of night, driving across great flat spaces. And Cody, like everybody else to drive this, has that elbow over the window, 
And he particularly with his thick, muscular, noble, efficient neck, like the necks of great bus drivers, was calm and relaxed and perfect at the wheel as you look out over his shoulder at that road which at night only shows a part of itself. The most conspicuous part being the five-mile headlights coming your way. Coming into Denver on a Saturday night. There's a swath. The sidewalks walk on the car lights catching the side hitches. And that part of the range, it jacks over and in laps the fence like a speed past the breakwater towards the road. Showing four lawn tufts of bunch grass and... took me home to meet the family once. I guess it was the first time I met his mother and father. So he comes trooping in with his little friend Lucian, and God knows what he told his parents about his little friend Lucian, right? So we're sort of sitting around, kind of uncomfortable in his mother and father's living room. His father said, let's go out and get a beer. Yeah. So we go trooping across the park to the nearest bar, and I come up with a quarter for my beer. Old man Kerouac says, no, I can buy millionaires son of beer. <laughs> well, how did he figure that I was a millionaire? Jack had told him. Up until the last time we saw each other, it was our greatest joke. My dad was a sheep herder in Wyoming. When the weather got rough, he worked in Denver as a bank. <laughs> I was never really interested in writing. Jack was. He wasn't just interested. I mean, no matter what else he was doing, he always found time to write. He was like, you gotta breathe or shit or eat. <coughs> he was always writing. And no matter what else he had to do with a job, or traveling around, or driving the car, or this and that, he always found time to scratch his little books. And he didn't have to do it right away either, which was the great virtue that he had. He had a memory like few men that you meet. Like he used to say, that's why they call me Memory Babe. That's what they call him in Lowell. He had a fantastic Jack was, uh, he was, well, you know, he, he couldn't be led, and he was, and he was recalcitrant, and he was a pig, and this, and that, and the other, but he was everything in a man that Edie thought could ever exist. Edie Parker was the best woman Jack ever got involved with, bar none. Jack didn't have trouble with women. Women had trouble with Jack. And he didn't have bad luck with him. It's just that he didn't want to be cornered into building something that he just wasn't building. I mean, he wasn't interested in doing that. I mean, it never crossed his mind. Someone would say, let's get married and move to the suburbs. And he'd like disappear. <laughs> Now, Edie's dad was a car dealer, uh, a, a Buick dealer. He had a big boat on Lake Michigan, and Jack could fool around on that. Now, money and wealth, that did impress Jack. And I imagine that six months of dibbling and dabbling around there, well, that amused him, but anything that tended to trap Kerouac, whether it was a woman, a job, or a jail sentence, he just wasn't interested in that. Now, Jack, with older women, with parents, he was incredibly proper, and straight, and deferential. My mother, to this day, will break into tears whenever she thinks of Jack, simply because he was so nice to her. Now, he wasn't putting her on. That's just the way you do mothers. <laughs> Everybody was attracted to Jack. You could not be in those days. My first wife, Marion, loved Jack. He 
even though she realized what a potential threat he was to the tranquility of our household. Well, Jack would blow in and the whole place would be in an uproar for who knows how long. He was never like Neil. He didn't try to con, he didn't control. But he was, he was like... And, and people would come over and fear would be gotten out. And... Well, she went along with it. Even though she realized his effect on me was a danger to her. But that was mainly her war with me, not him, however. When I first met Jack, I, I never read a word he wrote. We became friends not on the basis of that. He had to finish typing all of the time in the city then. Of course, I read it all and it completely knocked me out. And then suddenly, I saw that this man, who I liked terribly well anyway, had something else, that he was a tremendously gifted and unique human being. All through the getting of the town and the city published in the next couple of years while it was being cast around and typed from person to person, he kept thinking about the next book and <coughs> talking about the next book, which he always called he wrote seven, maybe ten beginnings to that book, and they all didn't seem right to it. This went on for 18 months at least. This was in um, 1949, and he became more and more hung up on his inability to write the damn thing. I mean, he couldn't find a entry And he, he wrote that whole thing, which is in Visions of Cody, Neil's Youth. He wrote that on hot. <laughs> For a month, he sat out there in Ozone Park. Every night, he got high on pot, and he wrote that stuff. And he would bring it in to me, or perhaps to Alan, too. <laughs> He'd wait until his mother went to bed. <laughs> and he had this, this tiny little room with, with a desk in it, sort of a, an L shape, like a dormer. And he closed the door. And as always, Jack's desk was incredibly neat. I mean, everything was completely put together. He'd blast and get high, and then he'd write all night. And the reason why those sentences are so long, exfoliating, and so incredible is because of the pot, it seems to me. <laughs> God, he loved that stuff. But he still knew that wasn't the way in. That's when he decided in, in 51. By then, he had uh, remarried again and was living in Chelsea. He literally said, fuck it. I'm going to sit down and tell the truth. <laughs> That's what he did. Jack in those years was just literally a two-box. He was an eye person. All he wanted to do was get a farm somewhere out in New Hampshire. He didn't want to live in the city. He didn't want to go on the road. Oh, no. He just wanted to find some girl somewhere, settle down, get married, and move out to New Hampshire, raise a family. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and that kind of thing. And yet, of course, he was always drawn in that other direction. More powerful, as it turned out. But in those days, these two things were just completely clashing. <coughs> His father's admonition to be a good boy and take care of your mother, that was still real strong in him then. That pull toward chaos, toward the road, toward the west, was equally strong. Indeed, stronger, as it turned out. <laughs> Jack had been at work on the town and the city for nine months when Neil Cassidy burst onto the New York scene, December 1946. Neil had come to live with us, <clears throat> and he'd been in jail for stealing an automobile or something, joyriding. And he had a crew cut haircut. Well, back in my grandmother's time, short hair was bad. Whereas in this generation, long hair is bad. So, Neil moved in. And I don't know, it didn't work out real well. There was always this conflict. My grandmother thinking perhaps he would lead me astray or something. And Neil did write. Why well, I read two or three chapters of the book he'd started. And it was really humorous. 
his dad? I don't know, perhaps it was on purpose. Why actually Neil and I were lived in the same room or within two or three blocks of each other for two or three years. And we were very, very close. going to another world then, Algiers was. I think that Burroughs was very much horrified by his neighbors, and I am sure they by him. <laughs> Joan never slept. Since Bill would be sleeping and the kids would be sleeping, she would be up most of the night looking for something to do. The house was sort of L-shaped and porched all around. And outside there was this dead, ghastly, barren tree, and it was just covered with lizards. She used to go out and rake the lizards off of the trees. <laughs> I don't think she killed them. They'd go back. That was their home. I'd never been to a movie till I was 21. I was so naive. I had no reason to be suspicious. I guess Jones raking the lizards off of trees is pretty odd behavior. Bathing 13 black cats and tying them up with string was rather odd, too. <laughs> <laughs> but then, I'd met Neil Cassidy. <coughs> and that was really odd. <laughs> After we left Algiers from California, we were going through the vibes. It was midnight on this little road, all the willow trees hanging down. And Jack proceeded to tell the story of the death of David Cameron, just like we were listening to a version of The Shadow. <laughs> it was really wild. He had me just for shivers up and down. And he was talking in that kind of voice deliberately. We'd been listening on the radio, because at that time, all our spook stories were on like The Shadow and some other old-time radio show. And that's just how Jack related it. Speaking in a low, mysterious voice, and picturing the whole thing with the river, the dark, and the streets. I felt like I was there, and I got the shivers. Then, we all took our clothes off as we went across Texas, and Jack went into that thing and all the road, saying that I smeared them all with cold cream and all that, which was totally unreal. I mean, we did take our clothes off, because it was sweltering hot. I mean, we were Any kind of cream. But the most memorable part of that trip, Jack didn't go into much description of. We stopped at some ruins and we all went over there. And for miles around, you couldn't see a thing. You could see this car approaching for a hundred miles down the road. And we were all cavorting naked through the ruins. And we saw a car approaching, which we all proceeded to ignore until it was just a few hundred feet away. Jack and I sprinted across the highway to get back in the car. Neil struck this magnificent pose up on one of these concrete platforms. <laughs> see this car slowing down, this elderly couple coming by. You can see this old woman on the passenger side pointing, and Jack and I were describing exactly what she was saying. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> because Neil did have a beautiful body. Isn't that a magnificent statue and the way it's held up through all the years with all this deterioration around it? <laughs> there wasn't a finger out of place. He must have stood there in that hot sun for a long while because they just slowed down to a crawl. Jack and I, of course, were getting lower and lower in the back seat. You know, when I look back on it, we really were lucky none of us was ever arrested. That trip was so abrupt and so cold. Neil left Jack and I on the street in San Francisco. Neil just drove away, leaving us there without penny one, with nothing but a lousy suitcase and each other. Why, Jack and I just looked at each other as we thought, where do we go from here? It was a wonderful trip, of course, but with nobody thinking about tomorrow. 
The rogue Jacoby Palmer I knew in the West, and I rode with him later, with all these tremendously frightening two-lane bumpy roads, with those ditches on both sides, and that poor fence, and that range fence next, maybe a sad cut of earth, a hair head of grass on a lump of sand, and then an endless range leading to mountains that belong to other states sometimes. And that road always seems destined to bounce you in the ditch because it humps over each way. And the feeling is of a car rolling on a side angle, inclined to a ditch, and a bump on the road will bounce it right in. And as a consequence of this, western road will only have arrived in any other. Long haul straight ahead. And on a Saturday night, you can see maybe five cars in the next five miles coming your way, each headlight smaller and creating the illusion of water on the road. When they're so far away, the lights are absorbed probably by the night mist or whatever it really is. The mirage of night driving across great flat spaces. And Cody, like everybody else that drives this, has that elbow over the window. And he particularly with his thick, muscular, noble, efficient neck, like the necks of great bus drivers, looks calm <laughs> and relaxed and perfect at the wheel. And as you look out over his shoulder at that road, which at night only shows a part of itself, the most conspicuous part being the five-mile headlights coming your way, coming into Denver on a Saturday night. And a swath, the sidewalk swath of the car lights catching the side ditches, and that part of the range, it jacks over and in laps the fence like a sea past the breakwater towards the road, showing forlorn tufts of bunch grass on knobs of dry, dead earth, flashing by in the night in swift, blurrily fanning succession just beyond, you know there are ends of the earth swinging out across the plain. Thunderset, a desert over gopher holes, over brush, sticks, rocks, and tiniest pebbles reflecting the largest stars, which are in reality galaxies. Till the inevitable mesas that terminate western horizons and give some indication that the world has contours and the flatness has got to stop. And all this is flashing by, and the stars are distant. If you put out the lights of the car, well, you would see what you sense. And Cody drove this that night 80 miles, and drove it many other times too, north, east, south, and west. It was perfectly still at the wheel for an entire hour, and averaging an almost pure 80 miles in the trafficless wilds, except for a town, while the fellows gabbled and drank beer, and sent cans banging after in the black of his. Suddenly he would go to all these literary parties. He was to be on radio, he was to be on television, appearances at campuses. It was heavy and it went on for months. But he wouldn't make these appearances or be interviewed. And the tone of the interviewing was often extremely hostile, you know. You say this about the beat generation. These are terribly immoral people. They take drugs. Why, what are you talking about? These are awful people. But Jack was pretty innocent in a lot of ways. He'd meet an interviewer, and he'd really try to communicate with that interviewer and think he had somehow managed to reach him as a person. And then the interview would come out in some distorted form and he'd see his very own words all twisted around. It was very, very upsetting to him. The only way he could get through it was to drink a lot. Well, he's really drinking. Uh, from what to him was a monster image of the candies. He was drinking for that and he wanted oblivion. And that's where the drink comes in. He always drank badly, he always drank too much. All of us did, some of us still do. But Jack drank seriously. That is, he wasn't just casual about it. He was drinking for the reasons. I was going with him to the parties then. The parties were a nightmare. I had this dream about him once. We had gone to a poetry reading up at Brooklyn College, and he was practically mobbed by all these kids. Well, I had this dream that we had gone somewhere together, and he was 
literally torn limb from limb by all the people. I felt that kind of anger in people. They were fascinated by him. They also felt that he was very threatening. They hated him. All the men wanted to fight him, all the women wanted to fuck him, and not in a nice way. In a very aggressive way. It was dreadful. And I decided that I never wanted to be a famous person. Sometimes Jack would go out alone at night. And someone would beat him up, knowing who he was. I think people saw him more as the Dean Moriarty character in On the Road than as the Sal Paradise character. Well, that's another reason why he had to drink. Keep up the extroverted image. He was really backed into a trouble, and it just got very bad. At the Vanguard, he was real shy. It was hard for him to leave here. Vanguard's a tough place to work here to perform in the orchestra. Now we play here. I did it. But it took me like 10, 15 years to learn to be in dives like this and still feel comfortable and kind of laugh. It's a special art. It's kind of like, like, a, like a boxer being able to enjoy working out in a gym. You just have to get used to that groove and go with it. But man, if you come in here and you don't know what's happening, you're going to get claustrophobia. You're going to feel like you're down a fucking hole. But to me, this place still has a quick kind of like crazy subterranean 19th century Parisian vibe that you know this place has. Jack was just freaked out by it. He started drinking a lot, getting real embarrassed. We were doing these jazz poetry readings a month before we played here. Bill Lavazia, Howard Hart, and Army of the Strings all used to come out, take them outside during the mission, they drink Thunderbird wine. <laughs> now I still play piano in the hallway, while people are constantly going by me, trying to go outside and talk to Jack. Then they all come back in, and sit and wait for Jack, and start shouting for Jack to read. You know, like most of the time, he wouldn't be back like for half an hour. That's when we all had to learn how to Improvise, improvise tune. The blind, you're like, this is half time. Hollywood actress and Ella Wynn. 
Ooh, ooh, and I love it. <laughs> what tremendous lovely tits Ruth has. Well, one strap of her dress is down, the other is flimsy, and they reach very low because their breasts are low, heavy, way out, and thus stretching the strap even further. Her left breast occupies me for five nameless unconscious minutes on the sidewalk of Times Square. And not just her breast, but a picture of it. It's so vast, heavy, and three-fifths concealed, which is better than any other percentage. <laughs> <laughs> now the nipple, the nipple is in no danger of showing you. What's in danger is the point at which the soft, yearning bulge might uh, plop up <laughs> almost out. <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, Ella is conventionally concealed. You can see the rich, delicious, soft living valley and the bulge in the fabric following the holy contours we all know. Well, now, Ella. Well, it's as if Ella was a strip teaser, and Ruth went the next step, pulling the cloth down, but only one end. And so instead of seeing one fourth up of uh, one fourth up of a left upper breast showing with valley, we now see three fifths full upper breast with valley expanding. Ooh la la! <laughs> <laughs> ah, those gorgeous breasts. Oh, and I stand here among the religious, dirty old men of the world, chewing gum like them with a horrible beating heart. And I can hardly think of control myself. I even know that this is infinitely more delicious than touching Ruth's breast itself. Though I'd do anything for the chance. <laughs> and so on and on for another tale of lies until the sentence ends. <laughs> Certainly need the patience of an angel to bear with this prose. Not only does it fail to break through into new vitality, but it is a style of a thousand times more literary and derivative and academic than the writings produced by the most anemic instructors of English in our colleges. <laughs> well, he's a discount house Whitman for the beat generation. <laughs> Latrine laureate of Homo Humus. <laughs> <laughs> inept imitation of Faulkner and Joyce, done by a man who thinks that to be a Faulkner or a Joyce, all you have to do is pour out anything that pops into your head. And the more mixed up, the better. <laughs> <laughs>